Welcome, everybody. Uh, Hello. I hope you can all hear me. Looks like we have actually, I can't hear any of them. Something's wrong here. Okay. Um, there seems to be something. What, 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 what's that? What's this? That says that something's not. You had your computer muted. I didn't touch it. Okay, can, can you guys you hear all hear me now? I can yeah. hear it. Thank you, and I can hear you, because I want you to be free to ask questions. That is important. Somehow, there's uh, buttons that I don't even know that I just am starting to figure out. Okay, let's let's uh, get to the task at hand. We have a lot to do and not quite enough time to do it in. Okay, let's admit these other people. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, there's a lot of pollen in the air so i've been told <laughs> okay i'm admitting the three new people that should do it up this is an important session it's going to help you know how to study for the exam <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> so we have about uh three well not about we have three new slides to finish we have to do that first okay so let me do the speaker view so that we can uh, focus on uh any questions that you have and you can see my <laughs> horribly <laughs> unlifelike image here in this terribly badly lit closet of a so-called office. That's what they give us adjuncts, is the smallest possible room in this whole building, in Annalee Hall, if you're curious, where the in-person class I hold tonight is in that full lecture hall. Okay, so um, we, we are going to talk about how to review for the exam and how the test is going to be given so you'll know how to study and what's expected of you when you take the test, which is next Monday. If you look on your handout, uh, that will be um, <clears throat> Monday, September 27th, and it's a one-hour exam. Looks like we have one more person. Yeah, I didn't finish that. Thank you for reminding me. That, that That's good that you did that. I wasn't going to forget, but but it doesn't hurt to remind me. Okay, Jack, welcome. We didn't uh, yet start with the slides. Yeah, we're going to finish with the Vermeer. I didn't give you either the meaning, really. I told you who he was. That's all I told you, who Vermeer was. So that's at the end of the YouTube uh, video. You'll see when it, there, th that and this video are posted, remember, by 8 p.m. on Friday. So it went over to recap. But yeah, we'll finish the woman holding a balance and then just do two more new slides on uh, English and French Baroque. And then uh, we'll segue immediately into how the test is going to be given and how to study. Remember, it's open book, open note, open book. So it should be a lot less stressful than most college exams, at least the way they were before the pandemic shutdown happened. Uh, and, and you will be allowed uh, to take a few minutes after I finish with the last slide uh, to check over everything. But I do have to have a cutoff of when you can submit the exams to me. So I'm going to make it midnight uh, of that day, but I'm not posting the exam. That's an unfair, would be an unfair advantage to my in-person class, which is the exact same, right? criteria, the same level, the same basic, you know, credits and everything. So because of that, I think it's only fair to balance it out where in case you want to transcribe your notes, you know, in some way and resend them. But, but what I'm saying, hear me now, because I'm not making exceptions and I'll repeat it with an email to everybody. And at the start of the exam next Monday at three, the test will begin at 315. I know we get people, here we go, Miranda. Yeah. We're just talking about the finishing up saying what the test is going to be is a one hour exam. I will be giving you, Morning. whoops, sorry. I will be giving you actual, you know, real time to write answers. I'll explain all that in a few minutes. You want to get to the last uh, two or three slides in, in just a minute. But the point is that you'll have a little extra time if you want it as follow up but I am not going to post that because that would be an unfair advantage. I've covered this with other, I've talked to other teachers, former students, my readers. It's only fair that everyone has the same basic standards, of course, at any given time in any program with any subject area. So you guys will have the live real time of one hour to watch the slides. And if you wanna go back and do some whatever revision or cleanup, you'll get a little extra time that way, but I'm not posting not posting the exam because I obviously can't do that with the in-person class. 
they will also be able to take a little extra time, but not very long. Now, what if you're sick? I need, it's not my rule, this is the department's rule. In fact, I think it might even be the whole the JC's uh, overall, but it is the art department rule since I started teaching. The only exception for people who miss an exam uh, who, to get a makeup is some written, and that's the key, written evidence that you had a medical emergency or a family emergency, you know, like a medical appointment or a prescription. Uh, or, you know, something that shows you literally physically could not attend that class. But being how it's open book and you're going to get, uh, uh, you know, plenty of time to study, it's five days from now. Um, I, I hope I don't see too many people not show up for the test because I, I will have to be, and it's not my rule, remember, strict. If, if I don't have written evidence from you, then that's just a lost grade. That's one quarter of your grade. You don't want that to happen. If you do a makeup, we'll get to that. It'll be if, if only and if only you provide written evidence of a medical or family emergency that happened during the same day as, as that test. So I don't think that will apply to very many people. But uh, you'll, you'll have plenty of time during the test. A lot of people won't even need that time. You'll see what I mean when we do the review. Let's get to the first uh, slide now uh, of the three more. We, we still have to finish the woman holding a balance. And uh, remember, this is by Vermeer. We, we, we started, so I'm not going to repeat everything. But Vermeer, right? V-E-R-M-E-E-R, -E -E of course. And it's woman holding a balance, okay? And it's 1664. I already told you who Vermeer was, so I'm not gonna re recap that. We wanna keep moving forward. So Vermeer was, I will restate this though. What, what's special about him is that he was the master of interior light. These are his three signature motifs in his, all his paintings. Uh, well, he did a few outdoor landscapes, but not that many. Uh, master of uh, uh, interior light, he painted indoor domestic scenes. That was his, almost all his paintings were focused on indoor domestic scenes, which this is. And then lastly, he was super sharp, real, he used, I should say, he always used super sharp simulated textures. There's your alliteration. Super sharp simulated textures uh, in all his paintings. And some even call his work photorealistic. No photos existed for oh, 200 years or so after after his time, but uh, or nearly 200 years. But we know that there were no cameras, even though some people claim he must have invented a camera and made a secret, <laughs> kept it secret. That's silly. No, he just was a very patient, skilled, talented uh, painter who could uh, recreate every detail, super sharp and realistic. Okay, so what's happening in this painting? I'll give you some clues since we want to, you know, not eat up too much time with the remaining slides, but, but this is pretty interesting. Let me ask, okay, you notice something about her physique, that should be obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody said it. Yeah, she's pregnant. Definitely, in this one, there's no debate. Remember with the wedding portrait, it, we're pretty sure now that she wasn't. This woman, yes. Actually, we know who this woman was and what she was, was thinking at the time, but let's see if the clues here might uh, give you, you know, some ideas. Uh, see, that's the thing about Vermeer. He liked to create a mystery in many, not all, but many of his paintings where, you, where the viewer had to look at the cues to see if, there we go, to see if you could figure out what's happening. Well, let's look at the clues. Okay, she's well-dressed. I mean, that doesn't take much discussion. Look at that fur-lined, right, fancy uh, cape she's wearing, right? And then as if this isn't enough, that isn't enough evidence, look at what's on the table gold, jewelry, you know, pearls, all kinds of valuables. And she's weighing them, the, the title tells us that, she's holding a balance. So she's weighing her, her wealth, you could say it that way, or, or, you know, counting her wealth, at least part of it. But there's a lot more going on. What's this? This is a painting of the last judgment, supposedly when, whoops, sorry, when Jesus will come down from heaven and decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. It's called the last judgment. Some of you know about that. Okay, let's just say that is a religious painting about what might happen uh, after you know, people die. But the biggest clue is right here, look closely. What do you notice about this shadow? What does that look like, anybody? A hand. 
Yes, it is. It's a hand. We now know that because there's been research done on this. Who was this woman and why is there a mysterious ghost-like, yes, that's no accident, literally ghost-like hand caressing or, or comforting her on the side of her, her uh, headdress. Here's what we know. Her husband was a wealthy ship owner. He had gone to sea, uh, you know, after she became pregnant, obviously, <laughs> unless it was something else going on, but no, they, they, they were able to conceive a child, but then he went to sea and he never came back. He died in a storm at sea. So now that you know those facts, this would then almost certainly have to be, right? His spirit, his ghost coming back from the other side or from after death to comfort her. So what do you think she's thinking? That's the last part of this, that's the part of the meeting. What could be in her mind about what she's going through? Okay, she, she's almost ready to give birth. Her husband, the father of her child has been gone for months and now she found out he's dead. And she's looking at the physical, you know, wealth that he left behind. But what do you think she might be thinking about her future? Anybody? Well, what could she be like how she's going to be able to afford to raise a child? Well, probably she, that's a good guess, but probably with all the jewelry and things, we don't know for sure, but probably she has the financial security, but what else could she be? You're on the right track. She's something she's worried about raising her child because she's going to be missing what? <laughs> well, yeah, she, she the baby doesn't right, have a father. Exactly, yes, she doesn't really feel very confident about going through the you know experience of raising a child by herself missing a father she's missing his presence and therefore she almost is like you could almost hear her thinking in dutch of course because this holland i'd rather have him here than all this wealth that that's how many historians have summarized the meaning or a phrase to that effect so you can write that however you want so that's the meaning here. So you see the mystery aspect. Uh, I used to look at this painting. It's in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. when I would visit D.C. And when I first started teaching here until like the second or third year, finally had a student do some research for a paper. And he's the one that came up with this information that that is supposed to be the ghost of her deceased husband coming down to earth, comforting her, saying, I'll be with you. So you could add that one last fact about the meaning. I'll be with you in spirit, literally, not physically, of course, and, and guide you or help you. I'll be with you, you know, in, you know, the, you know, a different way, if you want to put it that way, to, to help you get through, the, uh, uh, you know, raising a, a child. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. The formal analysis, this is so carefully balanced. Look at the area covered by the shadow under the table and the black frame painting, almost exactly the same. The area covered by the light hitting her face and neck and the area covered by the light coming through the curtain. No, I, this is very, very carefully balanced as all her pa his paintings are. Uh, the semi, I already said the semi texture, super sharp. I mean, I would even say in your notes, photorealistic. If you really look closely, you can see every detail on her, even her fingertips. I mean, the man was a master. There are people who say, how could he do this without some kind of device? Mm, he was talented. You know, there are people who are <laughs> that way, you know, and train themselves to be that way. Okay. And then we have the rhythm, of course, of the, the shape of the table, the shape of the, the painting. Uh, frame and this the smaller one here and of course her arms and hands and the folds in her clothing there's a lot of rhythm but it's almost entirely stable she's upright and uh, her her uh, her hands maybe or uh, lower arms are slightly dynamic but the table stable obviously <laughs> the wall the window framing the painting it's mostly stable uh, for space it's all the major techniques except atmospheric perspective are used here overlapping of course of, of her over the background and so forth, and her clothes over her. Um, and then of course there is overlapping of the table over and the painting against the wall and so forth. There is foreshortening on the table and on her. Uh, there's diminishing size with the objects on the table at least. Um, and let's see, I think those are the, yeah, there, there is scientific perspective. We know he did that. He actually wrote about his own art. He wrote how, how he came up not always, but some of these paintings, he, he actually wrote letters and things about 
what the idea behind was or the techniques. So we know he stuck to a strict realistic Renaissance depictions of space. So there would be a vanishing point beyond the wall. There's no atmospheric perspective. All the lines are thin, the outlines here. They're obviously, she's the largest mass. Then I'd say it's the painting and then the tabletop, if you count that as a separate mass. The colors are cool on her uh, upper garments and warm on her uh, brown, looks like a brown dress and the table, but cool mostly in the background, isn't it? Certainly on the walls and on this drapery here. And the painting, it's a little bit of both, of course, with, you know, a little bit of uh, hints of yellowish, or, you know, warmer skin tones in the background of the painting. It's mostly either neutral, dark colors, or, or, or uh, uh, cool. <clears throat> grays. Okay, I think that's everything. The modeling, oh yeah, modeling he was an expert at along with super sharp, in other words, in realistic modeling as well as semi texture were hallmarks of his work. Okay, I already said it was balanced. Okay, so let's now, quick glance, do you often write this? Some people think this is the same woman several years later, like maybe 10 years later. And judging by the date of the painting, that would be about that. If it was the same person, where the room has been opened up, the table may be the same table. This is just a theory. She, and if it is her, she replaced the um, painting with a map of North America. They see, there's California. They thought it was an island. You don't have to write any of this, but that's, isn't that interesting? They thought it was, it may become that after our next big quake. But right now we know it's not, and that's Florida. See, then there's the Great Lakes. I mean, by the late 1600s, explorers had traveled all around the coast, but they didn't know about California as being a solid part of the West Coast. Anyway, so this is a map of what they knew of the quote, new world. But if it is this woman, there are some, don't write this, some historians you say, see that? That's the hand of her ex-husband trying to get her to stop. He doesn't want her to marry somebody else. That's silly, of course. That doesn't make any sense, but I've read that a few more satirical reviews. So this guy's obviously courting her. But my favorite of his work, and again, you have to write this, this one, because we're running short on time, I'll keep it brief. Here's a woman, it's called uh, Girl Asleep. Can you tell, I'll just give it one shot. Anybody want to say, what do you think just happened here? You see the chair, it's askew, the tablecloth, there had been a meal being served. It's her house, because she's still there. Obviously, someone, the door's open, right? What do you think just happened? She's falling asleep or has fallen asleep in the middle of a, of a meal. So what do you, what do you think, who could have, not what, a, you know, what kind of a person could have occupied that seat and left in a hurry? A suitor, it's a satirical comment on male ego. It's brilliant because the guy can't handle that she's so bored by him and whatever he was trying to impress her with that she fell asleep in the middle of the dinner where he was perhaps invited. Maybe he invited himself. Anyway, he got so offended. He got up and rushed out of the room so fast that he left the tablecloth in a clump and the chair askew and the door open. It's, it's, it's very humorous. And he had uh, many, many daughters. He had 13 children, Vermeer, 13 children. And I think eight of them were, were, were daughters. And so he had some perspective on male ego from having seen them and their suitors. Okay, we're now going to do a quick stop here because we still have two more. Uh, this won't take too long to get to. And that is the English Baroque. It's in this file. Come on. Take time. Okay, here we go. Um, English and French broke. Just two more must knows, but they're both really interesting. Okay. All right, well, here's what I have to do to get it. I know I've done it enough. Now I finally got <laughs> pretty uh, competent at this. We have to hit screen share again and then. Hit this, and then <clears throat> we'll do this. Okay, you guys should be able to, it says I'm screen sharing. You guys can see this? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, this is one of only two remaining must-knows. And if you ever get to France and you get outside Paris, this is the first place I'd go to this site. It's world famous. The Hall of Mirrors, well, actually, the must-know slide is this one, but you got to know where it is. 
So that's the Hall of Mirrors, Versailles. And of course, that is French. And, and you know, guys, you don't have to worry about your spelling because it's all on the syllabus. It's all these slides that we might have on the exam uh, are already spelled for you, but you are expected to spell them correctly if any of them are on the, well, eight of these slides will be on the midterm. V-E-R-S-I-L-L-E-S, -L -L -E Versailles. There are two architects, Lebrun and Mansart. Again, all on syllabus, but I spell them for you quickly. Uh, L-E-B-R-U-N, and the other architect was Mansart, M-A-N-S-A-R-T, 1678. Well, the meaning of this, you have to know the context or it'll mean nothing. Just looks like a bunch of mirrors, right? No, no, no. It's, it's a world-class UNESCO World Heritage Site, the entire complex. So here, here's what you should start with. Versailles is the largest royal compound in the world. It's over 10 square miles. It's uh, about 30 miles or 20 or 30 miles outside Paris, not in the city or even the suburbs. It, it's a separate town. The town itself is called Versailles, but now they just mean the palace complex. And in that complex, tens of thousands, or just say over 10, let's keep it simple, over 10,000 people lived 24 seven. It was a town within a town. It was the royal compound of the kings of France. When it was first built, and I'll say this slowly, Peter, by Louis the Fourteenth, that's a really important fact because without him it wouldn't exist. It had been a little hunting lodge, you know, like two buildings or something made out of wood and plaster. Obviously, that's not what you see when you go there now. Has anybody here been here to Versailles? You know, yeah. have? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you get to go inside the buildings? Oh, of course. Yeah, because some days they, they just opened the park. Yeah, I've been there both days. Uh, the Hall of Mirrors and the whole thing's amazing, but that's that is room is, breathtaking. is really beautiful. I have a tip for those of you. Extra credit will be offered, I guess, if I didn't do this, it would seem like a, an irrelevant aside. There is a really well done international Netflix, so it's on Netflix, series, four seasons, I think it is, called Versailles. That's the title. The acting is superb. It's all filmed here on location. And it's the factual story of the first 30 years of King Louis. He ruled for 70 years. That's <laughs> a long time. He lived to be almost 90. He took over as a teenager, obviously. So he was the longest reigning king of France and by far the most powerful. Um, he was that, you know, what they called uh, oh, it's weird, divine. There we go. Divine uh, ruler, divine meaning God appointed him. Divine right is what they call that. He thought he, God only told him what to do. So he didn't allow any dissent. That series is remarkable. And I'll go ahead and tell you there is a little nudity in it. But anyway, <clears throat> um, you're all adults. That's not the point I'm mentioning is that uh, why I mentioned is because it's an accurate, even if you just watch one episode and you wrote what you learned about the building, because it shows how he built it. It took him decades. This didn't just happen overnight or three, four years. All through his reign, uh, he kept adding buildings. So that's what you see when you go there now is a, a whole town within a town, uh, a complex that is over 10 square miles. Now it's open to the public. Here was his crest and he called himself the Sun King, right? Supposedly, in fact, that's an image of what he thought of himself. There's his face in the middle of a sunburst. Yeah, he was in, of course, very, obviously very egotistical. Well, let's go to the must know. Yeah, this is the view, if it's on the exam that you'd have. So uh, the person who went to Versailles, I'm sorry, I didn't catch who that was. Um, did you have a guided tour or did you go on your own? Um, a little of both. We actually uh, had arrangements for a small group and then we kind of also were able to spend extra time and, and walk on our own. Well, that's great. Yeah, cool. that, no, I did it too. Yeah, you, it's kind of a good combination because there's so much history there. You can't, you could bring a guidebook, but just to look up which room on which page of the guidebook you have is which one, it'd take you forever. And there's so much you can't see it all in one day. At least most of it was open. I think it still is. There's a whole separate area where there's a, a mock peasant village that Marie Antoinette played milkmaid while people were starving. And I don't find her as a victim. I'm sorry. It's true she lost her head. You know, okay, her children, no, they shouldn't have executed them. But her and her husband, yeah, they had plenty of warning. The revolution was coming and they ignored it. They had, they had spies. They knew what was going on. So let's get to the facts you need to write now about the meaning of this. You should have written what Versailles was, right? 
and it's part of that complex. This was the building in which um, Louis XIV, who built Versailles, would greet his foreign visitors and his, you know, foreign dignitaries, like rulers from all over the world. You know, the, the French were becoming the most powerful empire in the world. For a while they were, before the British overtook them. First it was the Spanish, you know, during the whole colonial exploitation era. And then when they started losing influence, the French became the, the most powerful and wealthiest empire in the world for about a hundred years. And that's when Versailles was built. You can see the real gold, what looks like gold is gold. What looks like silver is silver on the mirrors. And marble, yep, yeah, that's real marble. So it's the most precious materials, including also on the ceiling where the paintings are, uh, which are scenes from French history, royal history, of course, of the royal family. So he was showing off his wealth and his power and his importance to his visitors. Then you couldn't just be anybody walking here off, you know, uh, through the gate. And just, you had to be invited, of course, and therefore you had to have some reason to see the king. Okay, so that's one reason this room was built. But then the other facts about it, I'm wondering if you, if the person who took the tour, if, if they told you this, and you should add this as the last facts on the meaning of this slide in your notes. Two world events occurred in this room, both of which were still being affected by, or let's just say they had ripple effects for, for uh, decades, generations, generations. The first one is the Treaty of Paris. That is the treaty that gave the US its independence. We might have declared we were independent in 1776 from England, but we weren't. <laughs> it was only after we won that war. So, so to summarize it, the signing of the Treaty of Paris, which granted America independence from Great Britain, was in this room. Pretty important event, <laughs> right? You'd have to say. Then the other one, anybody know what the second one was? It was in the 20th century. Uh, the other side. Treaty of Versailles. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. You got it. The Treaty of Versailles itself. So you just write it that way. So it uses the time, which was the, do you know what that was? The ending of which war? World War One. World War One, which many historians and I would be agreeing with this, uh, say sowed the seeds for World War II. Certainly Hitler uses an excuse to take over Germany and then almost all of Europe, right? Uh, it was a treaty that blamed all of World War I on Germany, made them pay all of the costs, the reparations, they called them. And uh, the Germans resented it ever since then. In fact, my great uncle Woody, no, he wasn't, Woodrow Wilson was president of the United States. He had his flaws, but he was one thing, he was ahead of his time. He created the United Nations. And you probably will go, huh, what? That wasn't until 1945 under FDR, yes. But FDR got his idea from Woodrow Wilson. Wilson created a League of Nations in this room, which then the US Congress wouldn't join. Who knows, we could have stopped Hitler in his tracks if we had been. So he tried to get some kind of system of, of world organization based on what the UN is now, it was based on that. So I'll summarize it this way, the Treaty of Versailles ending World War I, which caused Germany to have to pay all the costs and built the resentment that led to the rise of Hitler. That treaty was signed here, as well as the creation of the first international organization in the history of the world. It was called the League of Nations and then it, it didn't have any teeth. Without the US, what, you know, didn't have any power to stop anybody, Hitler, Mussolini, anybody you know so it was uh, just an attempt a, a starting point and, and it was the inspiration for the later united nations which we now still are a member of okay pretty important room then huh and there are a lot of other events occurred here too all right that's plenty on the meaning it's balanced totally symmetrical the, the mirrors are you know match each other of course that's it's cool on the walls you'd have to say right with the marble gray marble and silver lining the mirrors but the ceiling is clearly very, very warm with all the gold, right? The floor, of course, the inlaid floor. And then that's a Baroque, it couldn't be more Baroque. Incrustation of ornamentation, that's every inch of this room is practically encrusted with ornament, as you can see at a glance. And of course, bulbous, oh yeah, the ceiling itself is bulbous, as are the decorations and the tops of the mirrors. The unseen presence would, of course, be the king and his power. And the uh, emotion would be the awe you're supposed to feel, right? The sense of awe, uh, you know, at the power and wealth of France in general and the king, specifically King Louis XIV. 
Okay, uh, do we have to do the rest? Yeah, the length is about 220 feet. You can just say over 200 feet long. I think it is the longest hallway in any palace that I know of anyway. Uh, and then it uh, has about a 20 foot high ceiling. <clears throat> so that's a real space. And of course it's dynamic on the ceiling and the mirrors stable on the walls and the floor. The rhythm is obvious with the paintings, the decorations uh, along the uh, crest, that's, it's called the cornice line, the cornice line there, the decorations. Uh, they're repeated folk uh, statues of different historic figures, and not folk figures. People from the history of France, and they're lining every mirror, and the mirrors themselves, of course, also create rhythm. Uh, the largest mass would be the ceiling, clearly it'd be the ceiling, then the floor, and then each of the two walls. Modeling is just the natural shadows from the sun. Lines are painted on in the ceiling, carved on the sculpture, and visual lines around the mirrors, right? And you could say the fourth kind of line is inlay, right? That creates a visual line, but it's done by inlay if you want to add that, but you can just stick to the ones I, I mentioned first. Painted line on the ceiling, carved line on the sculpture, visual line on the mirrors. Um, let's see, I think that balance, yes, as I said, so totally balance here. Am I forgetting anything? Oh, color, yeah, warm on the ceiling, warm on the floor, cool on the walls. All right, the other one, the last new one we have, oh, I forgot to show you the detail. See, this shows him as a conquering hero defeating the Turks. You don't have to write this, you've written enough about this slide. Um, two angels of victory coming down from heaven to blow their trumpets in his honor. And there he is, they're about to put this crown back on his head. Not that he was ever, well, actually there were rebellions to try and overthrow him, but they were very unsuccessful. Um, he's dressed as a Roman general, see, on his favorite horse. And he's trampling Turkish soldiers who had invaded Europe, of course, uh, long before him, but they got all the way to Vienna. That's, if you look at a map, that's halfway across Europe from Turkey. That's, that's like a thousand miles away from where they were from. And uh, so they were invaders, they were conquerors, and the people in Europe did not want that. So they supported him. In this case, he actually uh, gathered a coalition of other um, countries, but he, ran, he led the armies into battle. Now, did he actually go into combat? I doubt it, <laughs> but he at least rode out to the battlefield, you know, with his generals and things. So he's shown here as a great heroic Roman you know, general or, or emperor conquering his enemies. Okay, the last must know before the midterm is, is going to be this one. I'm going to show you the must know slide and give you the title. And then I'm going to tell you a story that's part of the meaning that it's almost unbelievable it actually happened. St. Paul's Cathedral, just like it sounds, St. Paul's Apostolus Cathedral, the architects Wren, W-R-E-N. And the date is 1710. Okay, so let's start with the fact that this is the second largest Christian church in the world. I used to say church, period, but they, they can be defined different ways, you know. There's a mosque, a church, and so I just say it's the second largest Christian church in the world. And the only other bigger one, I think you already know, is possibly could be on the midterm, is St. Peter's, Peter's. Peter's in Rome. Yeah. So that's one fact about it. Another is that it is the first completely Baroque this a major Baroque building in Great Britain. Well, if you've been following the lectures for the last two weeks, I hope you have, the Baroque era lasted 150 years. Why did it take the Brits so long to get into that movement? Because they were stuck in the late Middle Ages. That's what a friend of mine says. You could just summarize it this way in one line. The British were one of the last, or Great Britain, if you want to say, or the Brits, if you want to abbreviate it, B-R-I-T-S. Uh, were, were the last major country in Europe to adopt Baroque style art. That includes, of course, architecture. There could be a lot of theories why it took them 50 or 100 years longer than the French, the Italians, the Spanish. It doesn't matter why, but they were the last major country in Europe to adopt the Baroque style. This is so Baroque it hurts. <laughs> I think it should be obvious by now, I hope it is when you look at it, that it's got all four of those Baroque elements. The bulbous looking uh, features like this, these cupolas here, look at them. There's actually three of them, but that's the main one here. And of course the dome itself, 
then the clocks and of course the, the, the arch doorways here and the sculpture in the middle above the columns, the portico it's called. So there's, it's got an incrustation of ornamentation. Again, if you just look, you know, every few right, feet here above from the entry level all the way up to the tops of these towers, you see there's a lot of decorative sculpture and things. So it's got an incrustation of ornamentation and it's typically broke. The unseen presence, of course, would be God and the emotion would be a devotion or um, you know, uh, religious fervor, if you want to say. You're supposed to feel when you walk into it. Anybody here been inside this building in London? It's the Cathedral of London. I should have started with that. Yeah, it's the Cathedral of London for English. They're not, uh, remember, they're not Catholic anymore. Uh, they're, they're Anglican. So you can just say the Cathedral of London. Keep it simple. Nobody here has been in there? Okay. It'll, it'll impress you if you ever go. And if you uh, may or may not have seen the Disney film, the original, not the remake, 1960s, Mary Poppins, that were the lady who feeds the birds and that whole silly part of the movie. Um, they show this building in that scene <clears throat> because lots of people still do that. I've seen lots of birds being fed on the steps of St. Paul's. It's a, it's a world famous structure because of its uniqueness, its size, and also who the architect was. He was the first great Baroque English architect, Christopher Wren, and one of the greatest architects in the history of the British Isles. No question, he did hundreds of churches. He did all kinds of other buildings too, not just churches, but this is his most famous work. And then we have the last part of the meaning. For that, I'm gonna go back to this slide. We'll do the formal analysis in the, on that slide. This would be hard to see the whole thing, so I won't use that if it's if it's on the uh, midterm. Can anybody notice something about the buildings in front of it? These look, well, they are, they're Victorian. I don't know if you can tell. I mean, you know, they're over 150 years old or so, but what about these buildings here? Pretty modern, right? Does anybody know why that's the case? Why so many buildings within, you know, short, within a block, let's say, or surrounding, you just say that, but so many of the buildings surrounding St. Paul's are modern. Does anybody know why? Isn't, was there a great English like fire or something like that? Or no, that was- There was, but that was earlier. The, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That is one of the fact about the why this was built, when it was built. It was built to replace a Gothic church that burned down in the fire of London in 1666. Some people said the three sixes were the devil at work, but that's pretty, well, they had a plague and a fire in the same year, pretty bad year. <laughs> Yeah, that happened, but that that doesn't explain then. Uh, you know, was it World was, War II? Yes, and that was called the Blitz. So that's what you to finish the meaning here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say that the building was the target of German bombers for almost a year, and now I'm going to give you the story of what really happened. But I don't expect you to write the whole thing unless you want to, and I'll summarize it at the end. So just listen, it's, it's, it's about a two or three minute vignette. Okay, so here we have Hitler's bombing, you know, of London day and night, killed 100,000 people, right? <laughs> you know, civilians, unarmed, of course. He was trying to beat them into submission, right? To destroy their morale so they'd surrender. He was afraid of invading them because of Churchill, of course, who said, if you attack us, we're gonna fight you on the beaches. You've heard some of you, those quotes here. Without him, we might all be speaking German right now. Anyway, so they were the only people, only country fighting Hitler for a year and a half until we got in, and the Russians, and we got into the war. So during the first year of the bombing of London, Hitler wanted this building destroyed. He thought that it would be easy, because look at it. It's a 350-foot-tall dome, and it's in the middle of London. How hard could it be? Guess what? Not a single German bomb hit this building. It destroyed these buildings around here, and then they rebuilt them in modern. It didn't destroy that one because that's over 100 years old. But a lot of the other buildings all around the cathedral were just completely obliterated by bombing. But the German Air Force couldn't hit a building this big. Finally, one German bomb, 500 pounds, that's a big bomb, did hit the dome. It went through, made a hole in the dome without exploding, went all the way into the floor, buried itself in the crypt, you know, which is well underground, and did not explode. 
The next day, Churchill heard about it, of course. He appeared with photographers from all over the world. He was making a statement to well, Adolf, he'd call him or whatever, to Hitler about the British morale not being broken at all. He stood above the crater because was a 500 pound bomb makes a huge crater like about a block wide or something. And you could see the tail fins of the bomb and he stood over it with his cigar. If he dropped the cigar, he might not have walked away. He always smoked going right in public. And he's looking at this and the headline underneath in some of the British papers said, eat this Adolf. <laughs> Guess what? Hitler stopped the bombing of London after that. Not totally, but cut it way back and stopped trying to hit this building because it wasn't making his Air Force look very good. So I consider that an act of where you call it what you want. Providence, fate, God, something was at work there. I mean, you it's think, almost impossible, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, do you think they could have purposely, the bombers, avoided it since it is a no. religious... No, oh no, just the opposite. That's my point. That's a good question. Excellent question. Yeah, some places that happened. In both, mostly, though, the Germans didn't do that. They bombed whatever the heck they want. We did avoid a few, not uh, everywhere, but a few even in Germany of their biggest churches. Not in Berlin, but in some other cities. When we get to Goth uh, later on to Gothic... No, we're, we're already covered. Gothic is my other call, sorry. If you take Mark 2.1, we'll, we'll cover that. No, no, it was deliberately a uh, target. In fact, uh, Goering said, Goering is the head of the German Air Force, don't write this, but he said, oh, mein Führer, I promise you, we'll have, you'll be rubble by this time next month. Mm, nope. <laughs> I'm sure it was defended well, very well, but still, you'd think in like nine months or something, month after month, uh, day and night bombing, they would have hit it at least more than once. And when they did, the bomb didn't go off. So that's how you can summarize it. Okay, formal analysis, totally balanced, completely symmetrical, as all Baroque architecture would be, of course. And you see the influence of Borromini here. You don't have to write this, but you notice the two flanking bell towers with the central dome, right? And the undulating, right, lines of the columns here and to a lesser degree on the facade. So the influence of Borromini from 50 years earlier is seen here in London in this church. Okay, then we have for space. Well, I, I didn't really say it's one large open domed space with about a 330 foot high dome and about a, another 20 foot high cupola. So the total height is about 350 feet, but the dome reaches around 330 feet. And it's open all the way from the floor. You can look straight up at it. And the rhythm is obvious with the columns. The, the one clock was never finished. No, I never heard anyone explain why they ran out of money. But that's obviously the two clock faces are meant to be um, the crate rhythm, of course. And, and obviously the two cupolas, well, really three, but these two are identical. Uh, and of course, the, the windows and, and uh, entryway there. So there's a lot of uh, rhythm, and then it is more stable than dynamic on the bottom half, but I would say above this line, roughly the upper half, the dome, obviously, the drum, and the upper towers and cupolas are dynamic. So it's, it's really both. The largest mass would be the drum. You, you can't see from this angle, but the drum is, uh, is bigger than anything else. I mean, so I meant the, the dome and the drum. If you count that as one mass, most people would, because it's attached then that would be the largest mass. And then it would be, uh, depends on how you break it down. I leave that to each of you if it's on the exam. You could say the facade, the whole thing, or you could say the upper section of the facade, but then it's it's almost an equal mass on the two towers. They're, they're pretty massive. So you might say that the, that the facade is the second largest mass, and then each of the two towers, of course, are equal. There's no modeling. It's just the shadows in the sun, the natural uh, sunlight creates a model. There is carved line here on the sculpture in the decorative detail uh, all, all across the facade. Uh, it is a cool white color. Um, and uh, it is, let's see, I'm not forgetting anything model. Oh, line, line here is, yeah, I did say carved and I think I didn't say visual line around the corners of the building. It's all architecture does. Is it all marble? Uh, yeah, sorry, textures, thank you. I almost forgot. Yes, it's marble. Well, at some of the sculpture might not be, but uh, the dome isn't. So there are three real textures. No, there's no simulated. Well, there are, but you can't see the sculpture, so you could ignore that. Three real textures that are visible here are smooth metal on the dome, smooth glass in the windows, and smooth marble. Or you can just say stone. Uh, it might be that some parts of it are, are not marble. I think all the columns are, but these two 
porticos they're called, right? Porticos. Don't have to know that word, but these two porches, they are marble. Uh, so just say stone, smooth stone, smooth metal, and smooth glass, all real textures. Okay, we are now going to stop share and, and uh, do full screen where I will now tell you the right way to study for the test. And I will go ahead and tell you that the test, let's see if I even have a sample of it, is two pages. But most of you will want to uh, do a longer. You will get it sent to you by JPEG. Uh, probably uh, it'll have to be Sunday. It'll be Sunday before, let's say, certainly before seven o'clock Sunday. So Sunday evening or any time before class, you'll have time. You can download it. I will send you an email and remind you of that. I'll do that twice, once toward the end of this week, probably Friday. And again, when I send the test, it'll be a PDF as everything is required to be. It'll be two pages, well, it'll actually be three pages because I allow an extra page for if you, are, if you want to write extra long answers, say that fast, right there, then you have that option. But I'm gonna tell you what's required, the minimum to get you know, full credit. But first, let's just say what the format of the test is. There are three sections. The first section, here we go. I'm gonna show you this as a sample of what it looks like. That says final, obviously I didn't say this, but the final and the midterm have the same exact format and they're worth the same way. Remember the final is not cumulative too. So the first page will be five slide identification. The instructions are right on here, but you know I will repeat them before the first slide. Remember the first slide is gonna hit the screen at 3.15. So you wanna be logged in by about five or 10 after the latest. So you're prepared. It's open book, open note. Obviously that gives you a big advantage over uh, the previous classes where I definitely didn't allow that. Um, and I'm doing the same with my in-person classes. So all you have to do is identify the slides you see on the screen, the exact same way they were on the syllabus. Same spelling, right? Same, and the year can be rounded to a zero, by the way. But, but why do that? If the date is right in front of you, you have your syllabus, you should be able to get the exact right date. Okay, and then the last name of the artist or the location, depending on which is given. It's usually the name of the artist uh, that, that was the third fact. There are three of those, sorry, five of those, five, each one of which has, I'll hold this up again. You see their title, artist, the location, and date. Three facts, and you are given Two minutes, that's going to be more than that. Most of you will be sitting there looking at the ceiling or drumming your fingers. I know I've seen it happen because you won't even need a full minute if you know it. Or you can look it up, of course, in, in the syllabus. So two whole minutes is plenty of time for you to answer those questions to identify the first five slides. Okay, that's the first part. Each section, I'm sorry, each section, each slide is worth nine points. Three for the title, three for the artist, and three for the date. So you don't have to be a math whiz to do the math five times, right? Nine is 45 points. That's almost half the points in the first 10 minutes. That's why you don't want to be late. I mean, I'm giving you plenty of notice, so please, please make sure you signed in by, you know, 3.05 or so. Okay, then there is, I'm not going to show them to you because it would give away future questions. Uh, second section is true, false where all the definitions I gave you, not all of them, but five, I mean, sorry, five of the definitions are going to be uh, uh, written out, but in a couple of them, I give you an incorrect statement about that definition. In other words, again, you should have been taking notes, of course, of the terms to know and have those notes in front of you, of course. If something's wrong with the way I defined that term, then it's false. It's pretty straightforward, you'll see what I mean. Um, and there'll be five of those, and that will be worth two points for each times five is 10. So you'll also have 10 minutes on that section. And then the whole rest of the exam, the remaining 40 minutes is well more than you'll need. Most people only need, or 45, so 45 minutes, will need less than that. But you'll have 15 minutes each on the final three slides, and that's where you write short essays. What do I mean by that? The slide analysis or short essay part. First, you identify it. This is all written out on the test itself. So when you get it in your inbox on Sunday evening or look at it before the test starts, you'll, you'll see all this 
repeated in writing, but I'm just giving you this as a summary now. And of course, this is being recorded, so you can go back and, and look at it again if you want to as a refresher before the test. The three slides, uh, you have to identify them first, like you just did, right, for the first slide. On the top line, the title, like it was on the syllabus, the uh, uh, artist's last name and the date. And then six sentences, that's all it requires, six facts about the meaning and six of the nine elements, not as much as you did on your papers where you had to do all nine elements and a whole page on the meaning. One paragraph, six sentences, that's a short paragraph. It's a pretty reasonable requirement, I think, for college level um, exam. And if you do get them right, if you give me six facts that were you know, mentioned in the lectures or in Stock's day about the meaning and you correctly analyze, don't just list. I know some people get, you know, get I don't know, frustrated, tired, distracted, and all they say is this is a dynamic work of art. That doesn't tell me anything. What, where, where's the dynamic lines and why are they dynamic? It's just like you did on your papers, but only six of those uh, uh, nine elements, the ones you can see the easiest, the six ones you can analyze most quickly and most correctly, you, you get six more points. So again, without having to be a math expert, if you do the first three things on the top line, you get the facts from the syllabus, the title, the date, and the artist, right? That's what three points. And you get all of the six facts about the meaning and all of the six elements of composition correct. Each of those are worth a point. So six plus six plus three is 15 points. And there are three of them. Again, that makes the essay part of my test equally weighted in value towards that total of 100, which means 40, if you get them all right, that's 45 points for the essay part, 45 points for the slide identification, and then 10 for the slide. Um, uh, true false I and mean, true false, which are based on the uh, definitions that I gave. We're going to cut that list down in just a minute here. We still have plenty of time doing well, but I want to pause to let you ask questions. Oh, I almost forgot one extra credit question, which will be a slide that uh, I took and I won't give you a clue until you see it. And there's no analysis. It's just make up a story. If you want to try for the extra five points, uh, and you give me five or more sentences in a short story, you'll get five points extra credit added to the total of what you already got. And that could make a difference for some of you between an A and a B on the midterm or whatever. So that'll be optional. That'll be at the end. I have a question uh, on um, yes. uh, well, the extra credit. So you want on that one, you want us to kind of give like some meaning and what we like. See yes, think analysis. Exactly. I'll give you guys clues. In fact, some people just choose to write in their own words what I tell you about what's really happened. It'll be a place and a, or a person or an object and maybe even an animal that is real and that I took a photo of. So no dates, no facts, no analysis. That's not, you already would have done plenty of that. This is just use your imagination. Everybody can do that, I know. And come up with a five or longer sentence, five is plenty for five points uh, about what you think the meaning is or what you imagine it to be your ideas, you know, make or or just take down the facts as I give them to you about who or what's in the, in that slide, and you could just put that down, and I'd still give you credit as long as it's at least five sentences. You don't have to give it a title, but that would be nice if you choose to. So so there'll be the same extra credit option on the final. So if you do both of those and get the extra five points, you've got ten extra points in addition to the fifty you can do on your own. So I'm really giving you guys what 60 points total extra credit options if you use all the options and you did both extra credit slides. Now, here's another caveat. I had this discussion with a couple of former students and readers, and it seems like I pretty much, um, I've already said this, I'm not going to post this exam. Otherwise it's an unfair advantage to my two Zoom classes over the in-person when they have the same basic value of the two classes, three units in art history, it wouldn't be equitable, right? Equity is the new password or byword, right? It, 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 under, especially in a college setting. So um, what I'll do is I'll give you until midnight to turn it in if you want to go back and do some corrections, but it's not going to be posted. So you need to be in the live session to see the slides during the test in real time. It's a reasonable requirement. Again, only exception in case a couple people join late 
you have written evidence, not my rule, it's the Department uh, of Santa Rosa JCR Department's rule, uh, a written evidence of a medical emergency uh, or family emergency, you know, like like you know, doctor's visit or uh, you know, a prescription that shows you had that day on the day of the test to be somewhere else, which isn't going to apply to very many people. So um, that that would then allow for an alternative, which will take you longer than the test. So you'd rather get it out of your way, since it's open book. I think most of you will want to just get that behind you, and then you're done. You don't have to think about those slides after the midterm because the final is only at what's after the midterm. It's not cumulative. Okay, I, I covered a lot, so I'm going to cast my breath, pause, and ask, are there any other questions about the format of the test? You'll get it as a PDF, of course. You do need to print it out so it's in front of you, and then you need to convert it however you choose to into some kind of PDF. A screenshot will work, or, you know, some people actually recreate the test. That's kind of cumbersome, but that's what you want to do, but you only have until midnight to do that because that could take a little longer than it would for the in-person class just to write their answers right there on the test. But I'm giving them a little extra time too. Uh, one or two of them in that class have a quote, disability allowances, A and B, I'll give them a little longer. But you guys definitely, if you wait to turn the test in after midnight, I can't accept it. It's not, I have to have rules that are equal for everybody. Of course, it, it, uh, what's called a level playing field uh, that doesn't give any one student or, or class or group an advantage or disadvantage over everyone else. So I hope it's clear. You, know, you, you can't say, where, where's the video? You didn't post it. I'm not posting it. Okay, and you'll see that in an email. But when you get the test, it'll give you kind of an early heads up. Uh, as, you know, I've already covered what it, what it, but you'll be able to double check how each of the requirements of the three, their three sections, how they look. Okay, so you want to print it out no later than 3 p.m. on Monday. The test is Monday, five days from today, the 27th. Okay, any questions? Yeah, just to clarify, so we're going to show up to class. Uh, we should be logging in at 3.05, come in at 3.10. You're going to show us the slides. Yes. Each one. Just and like we're going we've been doing. And I'm going to cut that list down now. It's going to help you a lot. I'm going to cut it by about 40% right now so that you don't even have to think about those slides. Uh, if you're doing a review, you know, some people make flashcards, some just look, thumb through their book or, or, you know, peruse the internet to see the images. But it's, I've had people tell me most people get A's, but remember it's an open book test, so I don't even see what applies. When it was all closed book in person, uh, the people who got A's consistently said they made flashcards and they, they had a study buddy or two or three or four that they'd meet with once, maybe twice before the test. But of course, that's more cumbersome with the pandemic. So you could just do it on your own. But really, you could just use the notes from my class and the images of each slide that are in Stockstead and the few that aren't, of course, you have the videos on YouTube. There are a few, maybe 10%, something like that, of the slides from the first a half, right, that could be on the midterm that aren't in stocks then. Because each edition, you know, they add or take out some. So uh, so those few, you, you you still can go look at them to review them, right? All, all the previous lectures are going to be on YouTube, including this one. This okay. one will be Friday, 8 p.m. Okay, go ahead. Now's the time to ask questions. And then we want to do the group thing where we cross out a bunch of the slides. And I have a question. As well. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, is there any way that the document you're sending us can just be a Word doc versus a PDF? Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm in, I, I know, I, I thought about that. I know it can be, a, my, but, but you've been already right receiving, I think everybody by now should have, uh, sometimes they don't go through when I send the group email and I have to individually forward them. Uh, we are required by the, this isn't even the department, this is the entire college, it's their rule. Um, the tech, high tech people, IT, whatever that was came up with this, that the most universally openable, if I can use that word, accessible of all forms, formats of uh, any kind of uh, form or document is PDFs. I, I had to transfer, I had to pay to have, you know, Adobe and all that downloaded on my computer. Took a long time, <laughs> the headache. So yeah, sorry, it has to be a PDF. And if you submit it to me as anything other than a PDF, I may not be able to open it and <laughs> you wasted it. So you will need to send it to me as a PDF. 
and the test itself will be in the form P. Now, if you have the capacity to convert it for some reason, you I could guess why you might want to do that to work on it and still get it into me before midnight, converting it back into a PDF. That's your call. Okay. You can do that, but I can't accept it, let alone grade it if it's not a PDF. And that's the format you're going to get it sent to you. And so, so Adobe is an important uh, app for many people. Uh, that's a good question, John. And I had that question too. And so what I've had to do is defer to my experts, uh, my wife and my daughter, <laughs> when I finally sometimes need to do that. But uh, I don't even know the reason I did finally get past my own stumbling blocks but you know i'll t tell you this there should be a way to find out if a fellow student can help you that did we see that yeah but if that doesn't work then the library can probably or i well it doesn't answer the phone so it's a waste of time i've never got them to answer the phone ever well certainly since the pandemic okay okay there we go everybody see this print it out answer with a pen yeah there is a, a motif at the top isn't there Rescan it as a PDF. Okay, thank you. You know what? Can that stay stay up for a minute longer? I did. Somebody posted. Whoever posted that. So people who are watching this video who might have missed this review. Anyway, hopefully they'll they'll see it. It'll be part of it. Okay, thank you for you know you being so helpful to fellow students. Yeah, that's the gist of what I had to have someone explain to me two or three times. Um. How do you mean by can't type an answer? Uh, Mark, you don't need, uh, I'm talking to our classmates. Okay. Uh, these aren't meant for you. That's fine. Yeah, but it I can be wanna... helpful to other students, you know, who yeah. aren't here, because we're only yeah. down about five people from this. Yeah. Good attendance. But there's always a few who, who won't see this live, and they'll see only the video. Okay, there we go. Well, this is really great. You guys, that's why Zoom does have some advantages. <laughs> and I appreciate it when anybody does that to help out your fellow students. Um, and I just want to clarify for when turning in, we have an hour to complete the. Yes, but I will stick around for a little while. Like I always do. I'll give you an extra 20 minutes or whatever, but then I have to sign off and you will have to turn in a PDF of the test completed before midnight. I think that's a pretty reasonable cutoff. Right? Oh, wait. I mean, it gives you several hours, you know, if you want to do this stuff about back and forth between Word doc and then reconverting it into or scanning it into a PDF. So you're saying that we have an hour before you go offline, and then we have until midnight to turn in. What yes. We, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Then that. Okay. I think that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, I was going to say I'd post it until midnight, but no, no, no. That's not fair to the in-person class. They have to do it in real time, and then I'll give them some time afterwards too, as well if they're still working on it. Uh, but I'll have to collect those when I leave at uh, 930, which is when my class ends and we have to leave campus. Okay, let's do that. Let's do this. It's really important. I, people signing off now, they might regret that because they'll be studying things they don't need to. So let us do the reduction exercise. Here we go. We're crossing off slides that are not going to be on the exam. Let's go all the way back to the first week. Okay. All right, week one, we're going to do this quickly because we have about 10 more minutes. Well, I'll stick around a few more minutes after that. All right. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Jess. All right, let's do this together. Take your pens, cross out these slides that I tell you now. We'll go week by week. Week one, cross off luncheon on the grass because we're going to cover some of these after the mention Guernica by Picasso. We don't even get to the 20th century. And Guggenheim's Museum. So that leaves only one slide you still have to study from week one, Libby and Sybil, right? I don't have to keep saying that. We're just doing the elimination part. And I promise you at least 30%, where well, you're going to see it's going to be more. It's going to be closer to 40% of the choice. Okay, week two. Let's see what we're going to cut. Uh, Jacob and Esau, cut that one by Giberte. And uh, the Church of San Lorenzo, the last two on the first page, cross those two out. I'm leaving all of the, the others. Okay. All right, moving forward to week three, next page. I already cut a couple of these, but it counts towards the total of the four, a 30 to 40% reduction of the total list from the syllabus. Okay, so week three, 
You should already have crossed out if you didn't now do this. Church of San Andrea by Alberti didn't cover it. Giorgione, we did cover, but I said it wouldn't be on the test. The Tempest, cross that out. And let's see. Yeah, I kind of want to leave the rest there. We'll see if we can get to. Uh, that, I did the, the count of how many slides there are, and it's, a, it's about uh, 60, so 30% would be 18. But I, if I do 40, it's two dozen. We should be able to cut that many totally. We're close. Week four, okay. <clears throat> Um, Bacchanal by Titian. That's under week four. It's the fifth one down. Return of the Hunters. We didn't even cover that by Bruegel. Um, I'm going to make it easier on the. Uh, okay, Cruci uh, Cru Crucifixion Eisenheim Altarpiece. Cross that off. And uh, The Last Supper by Tintoretto. So that's four. I'll repeat this all when we get to the end. Okay, week five. Um, I'm gonna cross off the Church of San Carlo because it was a black and white slide. That's at the bottom of where week five by Borromini. Okay, and then um, Rubens is pretty important. Okay, Judith and the Maid Servant. Um, I may go back and add one or two more. Moving on to week six. La Bohemian by Halls. Uh, we'll, we'll just leave the night watch. The Jewish Bride, you cross that out by Rembrandt. Um, and I'll go ahead and cut St. Paul's Cathedral only because, you know, we already have several dome buildings makes it easier. So let's see how many that is, because of course week seven begins um, the the next class. A week from today we'll start with uh, world art, and I think you'll enjoy that. India, China, Japan, um, <clears throat> and, and of course that stuff will be on the final. Okay, so we have I already cut one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Oh yeah, we got to cut at least. I'm going to make it an even twenty. That's more than thirty percent. An even twenty. Okay, so at least two more. Let's see. Okay. All right, week three. I'm going to cut, even though I hate to do it. Old man and his grandchild in week three. That make it right there. All right, and then week four. Um, burial of Count Orgaz by El Greco. Week six, much as I hate to do it, I'm going to cut uh, self portrait because it, there's, you know, there's only about four or five facts instead of six for that, the meaning of that. That is week six, the third one down. Now we need to cut one more to get to an even. 20. Mm. Um, okay, Villa Rotunda. Again, I hate to do that, but it's okay. Let's count. If that's 20, then we, we, we reached our goal with more than 30%. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, it's 20. That's that's about a third. In fact, it is a third. That's more than I often cut. I'll repeat that list one more time. Then we have to do a very quick reduction. It won't take us more than five minutes on the terms. Also, at least 30% of the terms to know. Then we'll be done. And I'll stick around for questions after that. Week one, you cut three. Luncheon of, on the Grass, Guernica by Picasso, and Guggenheim Museum. Week two, you cut uh, two. Church of San Lorenzo, Brunelleschi, and Jacob and Isau by Gilberti. Week three, you cut three. Church of San Andrea, Alberti, Old Man and His Grandchild, Gilandau, and Giorgione, The Tempest. Week four, you cut, wow, six. <laughs> Bacchanal by Titian, Crucifixion, Eisenheim Altarpiece by Grunewald, Return of the Hunters, Bruegel. Villa Rotunda, Palladio, Burial of Count Orgaz, El Greco, and The Last Supper by Tintoretto. 
And then uh, week uh, five, you get two. Church of San Carlo, Barmini, and Judith and the Maidservant, Gentileschi. And finally, week six, you cut four. La Bohemienne by Halls, Self-Portrait by Lester, The Jewish Bride by Rembrandt, and St. Paul's Cathedral, London. That, that's quite a bit of reduced there that you don't have to think about. Now let's do the same with the list of terms to know, and we'll call it a day then. Um, so you should have that in front of you, and here's where we go, okay, into... All right, let's cut Cherub. Um, let's cut Secular. Um, let's see. All right, Mannerism on the second page. I have to cut at least, I think it's six to make it 30%. Um, no, not six. How many terms do we have? One, two, three, four. Sorry, this I didn't count before class. 13. So four would be a third. Well, we'll make it five and then we'll leave it eight. So I've already got one, two, three. Um, let's see. High Renaissance, cross that out. How many is that? Leave? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I guess I'm going to be generous and cut one more, and then then we'll be done with this the review. And unless you have questions, and I will stick around for those. Um, you kind of need to know what each of these is. Early Northern Renaissance. Okay, so what we have now is a reduced list with uh, only eight slides that you need to know the meaning of. And that the last one is the uh, four features of Baroque art because the next uh, terms start after the midterm which we're gonna to get to on Wednesday. Okay, questions, we're right at 4.15. Any questions about anything I've covered about the review uh, for the midterm and how it's gonna be given. But again, you'll get an email reminding you of, I'm not gonna repeat everything I said because it's gonna be on YouTube starting Friday evening after eight, but, but I will remind you of the timing of everything and the requirements uh, in time frame, the, the requirements, meaning, yes, you'll have until midnight if you need it, but don't push it. <laughs> don't send me something at 12.05 a.m. I have to have a cutoff and I have to stick to it for everyone. And this is the same with my other, uh, if, you know, in case you're wondering whether a Zoom class online. Okay, any questions now? It's a good time. I always stick around a few minutes after, of course, the uh, last slide and now after the formal ending of the class. Now's a good time to ask anybody. Um, did you say uh, for the week six, um, things were cutting out. Did you say to cut out the Jewish bride or the night yes. watch? The, the, the Jewish bride. Oh, not night watch. You want to keep that. Yeah, that's a really important one. Very high possibility of it being on the midterm. I give you guys a few hints. So see now what's left over if you just take that list, you should have been doing each week as you go along, or if you watch the video after, if you missed the one week slides or something, and double check which ones were marked. I hope you did with some kind of a star or an asterisk or whatever a check mark. And then those are ones that haven't been cut. I just cut 20. I'd focus on studying those first and foremost. But on the other hand, everything is open book and your, your notes should be right there in front of you. And of course, as well as the list of terms, the definitions, and the syllabus. I don't want you using your electronic devices. Now, how am I going to know it's an honor system? That, that would be too easy. Yeah, but I can't know that. So whatever. If you want to be ready for four-year college, most of you are planning to transfer, right? 
uh, you probably should get in the habit of, you know, open book tests are not uncommon anymore. I know that in colleges, even before the pandemic. Uh, but but in any case, there will be times when you definitely can't use anything electronic in the classroom, just your actual notes, which is why you, of course, hopefully have done that already for each lecture. And you won't be able to do it if you didn't already. Everyone who's here now should have. If, if anyone missed tonight's lecture, they'll be able to do that beginning Friday. All right, so look, look on Sunday evening after about uh, 6 for um, yeah, Jacob Misal. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. Is it correct? Uh, look for the PDF of the test itself and, and download and print it out. Have it ready by three o'clock. And frankly, I wouldn't wait to sign on till 310. You should sign on as close to 3 or 305 as you can so that I have a pretty good idea of everyone who's here and you don't scramble around showing up at 309 or even, well, certainly 312 or something. You might not have enough time to get yourself prepared to start taking the test. All right. Now, again, any other questions? This is my official office hours, of course. Anybody? Um, um, I have one. Yes, one. sure. Um, I know you went over this yesterday already, but do you happen to have that little paper that you had written out of what the cover letter is supposed to look like for our papers? Because I did the paper and everything. I just yeah, really wanted to sure, write in. Sure. Oh, I forgot to say the papers are due today, but I had said that a whole week. Yeah, no, yes, yeah. I do. I do, but you got to give me just about 30 seconds to pull it up yeah, on no, my yeah. massive papers. Yeah, I've already met with a new reader today to her get started. Here it is. Here it is. Yeah, actually, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because there are people who couldn't see it. Yeah, it's really important to do it this way. And obviously, this is our 1.2 short paper number one, right? Oh, you know, no space. And then underline, and then last name, comma, first name as a PDF. So it'll show up in the blue box, this information. Then between me and the readers, I have helped me grade. And when I log all the, uh, as I said, I will guarantee I'll grade at least one of your papers and uh, personally and one of your exams. Um, a, a and B, I double check my readers' work. I don't just enter it, you know, quickly into the a roll book or the, the uh, grade rosters. I double check in case they might have, you know, done a math error or something like that. But that doesn't happen too often. But in case it does, I'll add those points back in before I interview the grade. So that's the way to submit it. Everybody, could be, they might need me to hold that up again. It's okay. just that one single line, and that's the only thing on the piece of paper, right? Yes. Like on that first. Well, that paper. that's in the blue box. I call it the label. You have the cover sheet. Right, everyone has that by now. That has to be in the same file, it, and some people can't do that. So, if you submit the cover sheet separately, remember on top of the cover sheet, you do need to write your name. I'm glad you asked that. Full name, the way you register, please. The class, obviously, is our 1.2, and the title and artist is that work of art that goes at the top in the, in the uh, space for that. Yeah, everyone knows, right? The cover sheet by now. <laughs> That has to be submitted as a part of the PDF. And that's when you should be able to do, you see the, the room for your name. The grade is left blank because that comes later. And then you'll be able to find out how you did. I usually just summarize what you got right and what you didn't. But if anyone needs to see the specific details, there will be a record of that as to where you miss points uh, because that's what the cover sheet's for. A, to help us grade the papers more accurately and objectively and fairly, and also as a record of how you did and why you got the grade you did. So yes, please, in the blue box, I call it, is that information I just showed you. Then forwarding to me attached will be the PDF inside that blue box, of course, with the cover sheet. And of course, the bibliography and the illustrations. Okay. Important. It's like a specific question, but I was wondering because sure. I had something yesterday. I just want to make sure it looked like you like you got it and things like that. And Which, that. Yeah, I think I said that the night I tried to get I'm not gonna be able to confirm getting everybody's paper if they all arrive at once. You know, I yeah, you know, I might or might not. But if I have trouble opening one or it isn't clear where it came from for some reason it wasn't labeled, hopefully there'll be a minimal number of papers. I will let that person know. And they'll have a chance to resubmit it. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, but this is the deadline is midnight for the papers. 
Now, I said that the last two classes, and I'm just now repeating it. I know I should have said at the beginning. But if it's after midnight, it's five points off the beam, right? That's pretty reasonable. You don't want to be putzing with the paper in the next few days. You should be segueing, focusing on studying for the midterm, which, as you all know, is Monday at 3 p.m. Okay, uh, still have a few minutes more that I can uh, answer any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, Mark, uh, I just want to clarify real quick. So that example you just showed us um, with how we title it, that's for the cover sheet or that's for our actual paper, how we should title it? That's how you, how it should be titled. The, the actual, I like, well, you know what I'm talking about, the blue box. I don't know what do you guys call it. The blue line that's, you know, like the thing that you see when I get the email from you that tells me what's in that attachment. That's the label for your people oh, the, the, the subject yeah okay okay yeah, that yeah, yeah that's cool. probably the right word yeah great great all right and Perfect. then the cover sheet will list like i just said either hand printed or typed in electronically the full title the artist's name your full name as what you registered in the class and that, that makes a lot more sense thank you yeah, for the okay. clarification yeah um and i think that was it thank you I just told everybody what I want you to put in the cover sheet. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at some point here, of course, you can always revisit this. Subject. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Sorry. I want to answer your question. This is what, what the title of the email, the blue box. I mean, everyone knows what that looks like, even if you never use that word. It's what I see when I get your email and I say, oh, okay, that's from this class and it's for this assignment. And of course, it's got to be a PDF. Then I can grade it myself or forward it to, to, to a reader to grade. I hope that helps. Yeah, OK. I mean, that's what we're here for, of course, to answer any questions. OK, I, I do have to meet uh, a couple of people who are uh, from the in-person class in the next 20 minutes uh, bringing papers to show me, uh, you know, to preview, like I gave you guys the opportunity to do, of course. But still, another minute or two, if anyone else has any other questions, that you need me or want me to answer right off. And then of course you can always email me. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, I think we did a pretty good job. I'm you sorry, know, that was from the other person. It was just typing it for them in case they saw it. That looked perfectly correct. Yeah, that's helpful. Again, I appreciate that you guys are doing that for helping your fellow students. It does you know, add clarity for many people. And of course, this will be posted, this whole lecture and all the questions at the end on Friday by 8 p.m., if not sooner. So. Okay. Thank you, you guys. Okay. Right, bye. Thank you. See you all on uh, Monday. And I expect to see your papers if they haven't already been sent before midnight. Okay. And then we'll. Thank we'll you. Start world yeah. Thanks, Mark. Have a good day. Thank you yeah, you too.